We only have one uh, couple of visitors today. Oh, from them, Larry and Patty. Appreciate you being here. This is a discussion class. We're on the life of Jesus. If you have a comment you'd like to make, please raise your hand. We make your comment brief because there'll be more people coming and uh, we'll never want to have a chance to speak. But we do want to hear from you. Uh, I want to remind you that on October 8th, we'll be having the potluck here for this class. And for those that are new here, it doesn't look like there are very many people. There's, I think today that there's 300 people on our email list. Uh, they come and go. Usually about 100 people come every week through Zoom and for uh, your attendance, you're 80 to 100 people. So we're expecting a good potluck. You're all welcome. You're supposed to be contacting Marge or to let, let us know you're coming. And uh, you can email her or you can email me either way, but really Marge is, uh, Marge is in charge. So uh, it'd be good to run it through her. We want to thank our Zoom folks for coming. Doug, good to see you. And uh, the rest of you out there, thank you for dialing in this prayer. Um, I think that is the extent of our announcements. Unless I'm not missing anything out there. Or not that I know. We still don't know when we'll be going into our new classroom. Eventually. Do you know? Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> Eventually we'll be moving. Before Jesus comes, hopefully. Yeah, I understand we have a chair problem. Is that it? I think that's been solved. Now we're dealing with Wi-Fi. Whatever. We're happy here. <laughs> so, uh, but we will be moving eventually and uh, just keep that in mind. But October 8th is the five block. Uh, Mark will be here next week so we can do that. So with that said, why don't we have a word of prayer? Wayne, would you mind having a prayer? Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of coming together and worshiping you and sharing ideas to get to know you better. We pray that we'll be very <coughs> nice to be ready to go to the current sponsor and give us good night. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good to see you. Abner, I am always blessed by the music that you select. Thank you. It seems like most of the songs, and that last one, The Great Getting Up Morning, that was just a, a, a rousing, inspiring song. But all the ones before that seem to focus on God's love and generosity, which is so timely because that's actually what we're going to be talking about today. But I just sat here basking in the music. Thank you, Abner. Sure. I, I was blessed by that. We are studying a story today that's a continuation of where John took us so wonderfully last week. John, thank you for the, the lesson last week. And this is, this is the same day, same group, same conversation, part two. And it is in your harmonies on page 130. It is section number 113. And if you do not have a harmony, I think we have some extras. A harmony is an edition of the Gospels that puts the four Gospels side by side in chronological order. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John side by side. Does anybody need a harmony? Yeah. It's our gift to you. And you can take it home and use it at your, at your home for study and then bring it here. The passage that we are studying today is only in the book of Luke, and so you'll do fine without the harmony today, but I'm going to be referring to some other passages, and I will be calling them out by the harmony pages, so it would be, it would be handy for you to have it today if you'd like it, but we are, we are only in the book of Luke. This story is only told by Luke, and so there's no parallel in Matthew or Mark or John. Everybody there, Luke chapter 14, page, and it is page 130 and 131, page 130 and 131. And here's my question to start us off before we, we read the passage. Have you ever been talking with somebody and you're talking about one thing and they think you're talking about something else? 
<laughs> all the time. <laughs> well, that happened to me just a couple times in the in the last few weeks. Um, actually, just a couple days ago, Lorraine and I had that experience. Uh, I'm curious. Anybody have a short experience? Not not a real lengthy story, but a, a short experience where you were talking about one thing, and the person that you were talking to thought you were talking about something totally different. Anybody? <laughs> Think no, I don't see a hand. I thought I saw a hand. Must be all the stories are too long, and that's that's okay if you're self monitoring yourself. The story is too long. Lorraine and I were talking about Christmas preparations the other day, and we were talking about gifts, and we were talking about travel, and both of them had to do with our Christmas plans, wanting to see our kids at Christmas time, and some of the stuff that we wanted to get them. And somehow we got our wires crossed and she thought I was talking about our travel plans and, and I was really talking about what we were going to be thinking about for some gifts and we got our wires crossed there and it just didn't make any sense until we got our wires uncrossed. Uh, several weeks ago at our place in British Columbia, my sister was visiting us and we were out kayaking and we're kayaking up the lake and and she asked me some question, and I thought that she had asked me about the buoy that we have to have um, outside of our place. It's required by the um, forestry and water department to have a buoy there that marks your spot, and it's quite expensive, and you have to get exactly the kind of buoy that, that is required by the government, and it's very, uh, very particular. If you don't have that one, they'll make you, they'll make you get the right one. Well, I thought she was talking about the buoy, and so I was describing to her my frustration with having just to get the exact right kind, and and that um, we we had to to get this this one that was special that was sat on the water just right. And she said, "That's amazing that they would make you get the exact kind of kayak that you're supposed to have on this lake." And I said, "No, no, no. I'm talking about the buoy, not the kayak." <laughs> but there are times when. We're talking about one thing and somebody else thinks we're talking about another. One other, um, one other thing comes to my mind years ago when I was teaching at Southern, I did prayer request oftentimes on a Friday, I would do prayer request. And my hearing loss is not quite as bad as Ken's, but it's approaching it. And um, I was, I was having trouble hearing and somebody asked a prayer request for their uncle Horace. And I thought that they asked for a prayer request for their horse. And so I was concerned about this horse that they were asking us to pray for. So, um, you know, you, you can hear one thing or you can be mistaken on what people are talking about. That happens in this story. In this story, Jesus is talking about one thing. And there's a guy whose comment, his outburst, shows that he doesn't have a clue what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about one thing and Jesus is talking about another. And that's where our story starts today in verse 15. Now we're going to go back up to verse 1 to get ourselves oriented, and it'll be a, a bit of review of what John took us through last week. But let's just jump into the story. We'll read it in one flow, starting with verse 15. And then we'll go back and we'll catch the context. And let me tell you the lens through which we're looking at this. I already commented because of the music that we were enjoying before we began our, our class. That this really is a story about God's generosity. And how God comes to us with such generosity and wants to turn us into generous people. That's, that's the lens through which we're looking at this. Let's read the story. Starting with verse 15, this is on page 131, page 15, or verse 15. <clears throat> when one of those at the table with him heard this, and the this is all that we discussed last week. <clears throat> when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. 
Now, as we unpack this, I think you're going to see why he was talking about something different than Jesus was talking about. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them, <clears throat> to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, when what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. <clears throat> <clears throat> like you acknowledged last week, John, when you led us in the first part of this story, on the surface, it can seem like it's a fairly simple story. And even the word generosity, he said, well, yeah, this, this guy is generous. He, he made a meal, and he wants people to come and enjoy it. End of, end of discussion. Well, maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> Let's see if in the context of the earlier part of the story, Jesus has something to say to us that we desperately need to hear about God's generosity and about God's ability to make us more generous people. That's where we're going with this story today. How does this story help us to understand and appreciate God's generosity more and become more generous people like God is? That's where we're going with this. But it might be helpful first if I just asked you, do you have a working definition of the, of the word generosity? I know that word is not in the story, and actually it's a word that is not used much in Scripture. The idea is certainly there, but the words generosity, the word generosity or generous, generously, only used probably several dozen times throughout all of Scripture. And we may take a look at some of those others, but certainly the concepts are there. The idea of generosity, and this is a story that, that we'll see if you is, don't see it already is, is, is a lot to do with generosity. But what is your, what is your working definition of generosity? When, when you hear the word generous, when you use the word generous, let me hear from some of you. Anybody? Selfless, not thinking about yourself. Okay, selfless. Thank you, Marge. Selfless, not thinking about yourself. Somebody else. Generous, generosity. Go ahead, Gordon. Uh, I was thinking, uh, based on the comment I got from my wife here, it's sharing what you have, including your time. Sharing what you have, including your time. Yeah, time is sometimes one of the most precious commodities we have and, and can be very hard to be generous with our time. Yeah. Thank you, Gordon. Somebody else? Working definition of generosity, please, in the back. Is that Roy? Yes. 
Hi, Roy. I'd like to add in a concept of the 144,000 from the great publisher. Mm -hmm. The 144,000 are those that are God's believers. Mm -hmm. How they are given of their selflessness to be able to bring in the great multitude at the end of time. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly, those people who have become so much like Jesus have become generous people. Anybody else? Generosity, working definition. One more, Rod. Um, giving of your time and of yourself with an open hand, irregardless of who you're giving it to, deserves it or not. Ah. Uh, you have added a beautiful piece here. And in fact, it's a passage that I, I hope we'll take a look at in, in a moment. And that is in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, I want you to become like God. He causes his rain to fall upon, do you remember how it finishes? Depending on the translation, the just and the unjust, the good and the evil. I want you, Jesus goes on to say, to become like that where you give generously, not just to the people who you like, but to others too, because that's how God treats people. And, and then Jesus goes on to say, if you only are kind to the people who are like you, then isn't that just a very ordinary human reaction? But when you show kindness and a generous spirit to people you don't like or who don't like you, then you are truly becoming more like your father in heaven. Yeah, beautiful passage. Thank you, Rod. Well, this, <clears throat> this story has many of those ideas in it. Let me just add one piece that I haven't heard too much yet in your, in your comments, although, Rod, you were, you were moving this direction, and that is oftentimes generosity does not include giving anything material, and it may not even be giving of our time. It may be giving of a generous spirit and is kind of the opposite of a mean spirit or the opposite of a spirit of criticism. And think about people who have a generous spirit to those around them who manage to see the good in other people instead of always seeing the problems in other people or the, the, the quirky, strange, irritating stuff in other people. They, they just have a generous spirit about them that tends to see people with a spirit of generosity. And that's a beautiful thing. That also is encompassed in this idea of generosity. And certainly it is how God loves us you think about what Paul says in Romans 5, where he says, well, we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And he said, certainly, some people would die for a good person. But how much more God has shown his love for us, that while we were his enemies, Jesus came and gave himself for us. God's spirit is generous to us from start to finish. And I'll come to you in just a second, Gordon. But that spirit of generosity is demonstrated in this story. And then there are clues in the story how God calls us into a more generous spirit. And my hope would be that as a result of our study together today and looking at the story, we'll say, wow, I hadn't quite seen that about God's generosity. And I am called to a more generous spirit myself. Gordon, your comment. Well, when I think about this story, <clears throat> It seems to me that there's a complexity in it that is, we have to think about. Because mm -hmm. in the end, Jesus says, look, if I invited you and you decided you weren't going to come, that's it. I'm done with you. You don't get any more. Which doesn't seem very generous, does it? <laughs> and, and, and therein lies the complexity. How can this be a story about God's generosity if there's a point in the story where God says, okay, bam, door is slammed. Is, is that kind of where you're going with that, Gordon? Yeah. Let's hold that thought. Let's not start there, but let's let's make sure that we, we don't miss that point before we finish. Yes, please, Keith. 
I'm wondering how far generosity goes to hurt. Where it hurts, then you're really being generous. Uh, where that border is. Now, let me see if I'm hearing what you're saying, because sometimes we even use offering appeals. In, I've heard this in an offering that people will say, give until it hurts. Maybe some of you have heard similar comments. Is that the sort of thing you're referring to, Keith? Correct. Yeah. And so if it hurts, is that really generosity or is that something else that's driving us? Are we being driven by guilt or shame or something there? Yeah. Ken, I think you had a comment. I want to back up a few minutes about being generous, about not giving with money or your time. Um, not that I'm the most generous person in the world, but I just thought of something. How do you be generous without giving your money or your time? Mm -hmm. Two years ago, I was out in a crowd and uh, someone came up to me and said, you know so-and-so, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, did you know he did this and this and this? And I can't believe he did that and that and that and this. And I stood there and said, well, that's a lie. Yeah. He didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way he would do that. Yeah. And I think there's ways, like for saying, I mean, well, yeah. they're getting out your check, bro. Yep. Right? yep. Totally. And, yeah. and Ken, I think that sometimes those are the most important ways to be generous. You know, I never thought about this before, Ken, but what you're describing, you didn't use the word gossip. But I would say that we could almost say that gossip is the opposite of generosity. Yeah. Gossip is stealing somebody's reputation, smearing somebody's reputation, pushing them into a spot that makes them look uglier than they really are that's what gossip is all about and generosity is the opposite it's the spirit of building somebody up and making them bigger better than they are and and gossip and generosity might be the opposite of each other in some settings thanks ken great great insight that was about okay. that was really john castro but i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> okay let's let's come back to our story now let's let's come back to verse 15 and and let's begin looking at the story a bit um in in, in more detail when one of those at the table with him heard this now this raises several questions who was at the table what had they just heard and why does he say what he did so we have to go back to the beginning of the story that we studied last week to see the answer to those questions. So come back to verse one. One Sabbath, by the way, can I see the hands of those who were with us last last week? Okay, so some of you were, and, and this will be a bit of review, some of you were not, but let's, let's take a quick look at the first part of the story. Verse one, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee. So here we have the setting. This is a Sabbath meal, and it's in the home of a Pharisee, and not just any Pharisee, but a prominent Pharisee. And, and John unpacked that for us a little bit last week. Let's keep reading. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts of the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Now, this didn't come up in our discussion last week, but it could certainly be said in this context. Now, Jesus treated this man generously. <laughs> Jesus gave generously. In fact, one of Jesus' hallmarks of Sabbath was generosity. Jesus received generously of all the blessings that God wanted to give on the Sabbath, and he gave generously of all of God's blessing on the Sabbath. And he turns to his guest, I mean his fellow guest, not his guest, but the others who were there at this dinner, and he questions them on the subject of generosity. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. Jesus is challenging them on their small heartedness as compared to his generosity. Jesus sees a need and he wants to generously 
give to meet that need. They see a need and their tight, small little hearts say, what is this going to cost me? I think this is going to cost me some Sabbath infraction, and I don't want to run the risk of a Sabbath infraction. Therefore, I will do nothing. <clears throat> we could look at this all different ways. And John, you ended the lesson last week with some discussion about the Sabbath, which we're not going to repeat that. But I just want you to see the context has already been set where Jesus is drawing a sharp line between small, tight-hearted self-absorption on the one hand and a generous spirit on the other. And Jesus is showing this generous spirit, which he loved to do on the Sabbath, and to show a generosity which showed almost no bounds. And then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. <laughs> when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of your fellow guest. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And again, not to repeat the lesson from last week, but, but there was a beautiful discussion on what honor is, what it means to give honor what it means to receive honor. And even that is tied up with generosity. Sometimes we are afraid to honor other people because somehow we feel like if they get honored, we don't get the attention that we want or that we deserve by honoring others. And again, it's a lack of generosity. Honoring another person is another way of expressing generosity. And what Jesus is saying here is that, like handling perfume, you can't give honor without it leaving some of its beautiful scent on you. We don't need to be afraid of being generous for fear that we're going to lose something. Now, Kate, this comes to your comment about hurting, and I think that we might want to hold that one as well as Gordon's comment about does God have a limit to his generosity? And I think we might want to hold those thoughts and see if we can come back to them at the end. But certainly the, the momentum that, of this story is toward Jesus demonstrating generosity and inviting the people who are listening to him to enter into that generous spirit with him. Now, let's keep reading and see where he goes with this and how it leads into this outburst from the man who probably doesn't get what Jesus is talking about and is talking about something very different than Jesus is talking about. Then Jesus said, verse 12, then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And it was probably that last phrase, repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, that just prompted this spontaneous outburst from one of the people sitting there at this feast. This is a feast at a prominent Pharisee's home on a Sabbath afternoon, likely, maybe a Saturday night. And very likely the people at a prominent Pharisee's home would be other Pharisees and other highly placed social people and people who tend to think alike. And so by his spontaneous comment, he probably is expecting to get amens and nods of approval and yeah, that's it, from the people around him. His spontaneous outburst is more likely designed to get the agreement of the crowd than it is to respond to what Jesus has just said. 
because Jesus makes it clear that they're on two different pages. What this man says is not so much in response to what Jesus has just said. It's in response to the group he's with, hoping to get group approval from them. And let's now see what he says. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. And of course, the link here is the feast in the kingdom of God and the resurrection of the righteous. Those were the connecting points. The feast at the kingdom of God was identified with the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus had done this in conversations before. We won't turn there, but I will refer to a story we've studied in the past, and it's the story of the centurion coming for the healing of his servant. And you remember what Jesus says after the, the centurion leaves. He says, I haven't seen such faith, not even in Israel. And then he goes on to say, he says, and at the resurrection of the righteous, I tell you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down and feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But those of the kingdom will be cast out into utter darkness. Do you remember this story? And Jesus couples the two ideas together, that the resurrection, which will include such people as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they will feast together with unlikely people. They will be there with the people that the Jews didn't think should be there, people like the centurion. And here the same two ideas are being tied together. But this guy is talking about something different than Jesus is talking about. And that's what we want to explore because that becomes our jumping off point for understanding what Jesus is saying about becoming more generous like God is generous. Now, I don't know if we have made too big a leap of logic here if we're connecting the dots well, let me give you a chance to make some comments, ask some questions, because I'd like to go a little bit deeper into that. Gordon, you've got a comment. I'm just wondering here, is this guy really missing the boat here? I mean, he's Maybe a not. Maybe not. You, and what Jesus had just said to him was, you know, you really should have the poor and the wretched and all that. Mm -hmm. And then he stands up and says, blessed are the men or those people, apparently, mm -hmm. that will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So why couldn't that link be there? It could be. And, and I'll tell you the reason I have come to the conclusion I have, but I, I admit it may not it may not be accurate. And that is because Jesus does not affirm what he says. Instead of Jesus, Jesus challenges and goes back to what he had said before, which apparently the guy had missed. That's that's why I've come to the conclusion I have. Okay, but uh, I, I I may be wrong. But but let me let me at least play that out. Why I why I'm choosing to go that direction with understanding this. Jesus replied. A certain man was preparing a great banquet. Now, Jesus tells a story here. He does not talk about the banquet at the resurrection. Instead, he tells a story that's a fairly ordinary story about a guy making a banquet. It may have been a wedding banquet, may have been some other banquet. And at the end, the people who show up at the banquet are, in fact, these same sort of unexpected people, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Jesus is going back to his same point of saying, you've missed who these guests are. And the guests are the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And I think that that is, in, in my understanding, that's the point that this guy has missed because what he seems to be emphasizing is looking around this table there aren't the poor, the blind, the lame. Instead, there's his buddies, his rich buddies. 
And he is emphasizing the blessedness. And again, I'm going from the context of Pharisees and how Pharisees tended to look at other people. They were the elite. They were the chosen ones. They were the ones who were doing everything right. And they were the ones who expected to be sitting at that table in the kingdom of God. And I, I think that for me, the key word is the kingdom of God, and that they did not understand the kingdom of God in the same way that Jesus did. Jesus is talking about one type of kingdom, and they're talking about another type of kingdom. And, and that's, that's where I'm going with this. But Gordon, I am certainly open to not understanding it correctly. I would like to demonstrate something about the kingdom that I think all through our study of the gospel shows that up until the death of Jesus, people still did not understand the kingdom. And the misunderstanding of the kingdom is what created oftentimes Jesus and his even his followers talking past each other. John, you look like you had a comment. I um, I think that Jesus's point about inviting one set of people <clears throat> doesn't mean that I should necessarily go out and look for blind and lame people and invite them in. <clears throat> Although that's not a bad thing. I think what he's looking at is what's our intent in inviting people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if my intent is to get something out of it for me, I'm, I am posturing myself as being a little bit self-serving that I need to feed my ego. I want to get an invite to your house. I want, I want, I want. Versus truly inviting people in because you want to honor them. And through honoring them, maybe I'm also honoring myself. Maybe that's not all bad. Uh, maybe I receive honor, but that's not my intent. Mm -hmm. My intent is to truly honor others yep. without any strings attached. Yep. Again, it's Mark brought it up earlier in the first yep. talk about generosity, and that is yep. it's it's selfless. As soon as it yep. becomes selfish, yep. I want something out of this, then it's tainted. <laughs> Another co thank you, John. Another comment, John, but behind. Yes, sir. So I'm reminded of when Peter went to uh, Cornelius's house. He said, "You know that it is against the law for me, a Jew, to eat with you," mm -hmm. which is exactly the opposite of what God said to Abraham: yeah. "Shall all the nations of the earth be blessed?" Yeah. And the Jewish people. They turned up their nose as soon as the Magi, the wise men from the east, came bringing their gifts to Jesus. Mm -hmm. it means God's going to pass us <clears throat> up and let these Gentiles yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, know about uh, God's coming. From that time forth, they turned their nose up at the Gentiles a little bit more, and they turned their nose up at Jesus every time they got a chance. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, John. Did I miss any other hands? Gordon, please. I'm sorry. My hand has this balloon attached to it. You know? I noticed that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, I was thinking here, we got a double story here. We've got yeah. a story about God and how he treats people uh -huh. and about how he wants us to not focus on the glory of the person we want to be with but right. rather on the need yep yep you're right and then we have again this story is complex because people's reactions to one another can get fairly complex and so we have that as well as the two things that that you brought up gordon and that keith brought up and that is is there a time when god's generosity runs out and what does it mean to give generously if it hurts is that really generosity okay i think rod had his hand up and then roy and then i'd like to pull us back to the idea of the kingdom of god because i think that's that's the key to understanding the story rod and then roy 
in some of the uh, reading this story on the surface of it, you'd think it was a commentary on our social behavior. You know, this is mm. when I come to potluck, I want to sit next to, you know, yeah. so I want to, whatever. The story is not necessarily our social behavior, but the story is actually about who will accept. Yeah. And the, the, it's the generosity of God is on display here. And he <laughs> gave his, his invitation to a lot of different people uh -huh. Uh -huh. And those who didn't accept yeah. the one sitting at that table where he was sitting with the thought that they thought they were shooed in they were they were were the only invited ones and jesus was saying no i'm here to give you a kingdom work your generosity is always looking out for the well-being of everyone yes yes and and those of you who think you're accepted or are invited you're not accepting the right kingdom. Yep. These people over here, even though they're in the ditches, so to speak, socially and whatever, they're willing to accept. Yes. Oh, Rod, you have said many, many helpful things for this story. And I just want to underscore that, that this is not so much a social commentary saying, okay, at the potluck, make sure you're sitting next to somebody in a wheelchair. <laughs> That's not what he's saying here. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And then this idea that the people who are rejecting God's generosity, there's something there very rich that we'll need to come back to. What does it mean to say no to God? And we say, no, thanks. I, I'm not interested. What's that all about? So thank you for pointing those out. Let's go to Roy. And then I want to come back to the kingdom of God. Yeah. What I wanted to address is what you asked about God's generosity. <laughs> If you go to Psalms, the 36th chapter, and the pastor ended his sermon today with that, you have 26 presentations of God's generosity. Mm. And in all of these actions, he gave us mercy at each and yes. every time. Yes. We yeah. understand that. If you read Psalms 136, uh, you'll yeah. see God's generosity. Yep. Yeah. Amen. It sounds like those of you who have not yet heard today's message are in for a real treat. I think there's one more. Was it was it um, Jana? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna stand up because I'm always told I can't. Nobody can hear me. <laughs> Thank you. And <laughs> um, so I was thinking along the same line is whenever I look at this, they were. The Pharisees were correct. They had been invited. They had been sent a formal invitation. Yeah. But he then sent his servant and said, okay, it's time, it's time. And we're given at least three excuses that were given so that they couldn't come. But I have to believe there were some that were sent a formal invitation that accepted. But mm -hmm. there were still so many places available. Yeah. That God's like, I don't think the poor, the lame, and the crippled he was actually meaning poor, lame, and crippled necessarily. But these people believed that those that were poor, lame, and crippled were poor, lame, and crippled because they've sinned so much. Yes, yes. That Key they point. deserve to be in heaven. Yeah. That they didn't deserve to be. And the poor, the lame, and the crippled, they didn't even expect to get invited to the banquet. Yeah. So when they were told, come on into the banquet, they rushed in. <laughs> yeah. They weren't going to make an excuse. Maybe they had just gotten married. Maybe yeah. they hoped to buy a piece of land. <laughs> yeah. that. Maybe they had all the same excuses, but they weren't ever expecting to get in. And so when they got in, they rushed in. Yeah. So Nicely said. And then he still said, go out in a further distance. Go out further. Go into the country lane and bring them in. Yeah. And Thank you. Thank you. So even people that have gone further than you expected my grace to go. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And bring them in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is rich, rich stuff and just provides a beautiful transition into the picture of the kingdom of God. When we say the kingdom of God, we oftentimes just hear it as a cliche and don't stop and think anything. There's many ways that we could define the kingdom of God. For today, for the purposes of our study today, 
Let me invite you to think of this as the kingdom of generosity. And I want you to just catch how different that is than the average Jewish person. In fact, if anything, the average Jewish person saw the kingdom of God as a kingdom of exclusion. They define the kingdom of God as who was kept out. Jesus defined the kingdom of God as who was drawn in. And just catch that distinction and think about that for a moment. They were very clear. You didn't belong. You didn't belong. You didn't belong. The kingdom of God is a very few people who act and think and look and, and talk like us. And that's the kingdom of God. And we're not even quite sure about some who think they're part of the kingdom of God. They were constantly looking to exclude people. And the ultimate of the kingdom of God was when the Messiah would come, in their minds, when the Messiah would come and get rid of their enemies, primarily the Romans, but other people too, get rid of all of those bad people, all of these people that they didn't like, that they didn't want there, push them out, literally push them out of the, the territory, the geography upon which they were living, and say, get out, this is our kingdom, and we're going to make this the way we want it. Their picture of the kingdom of God was pushing others out and drawing the circle even tighter around those who looked and acted and thought it like they did and say, now this is our kingdom. Get out of here if you're not like us. And Jesus came exactly the opposite. He said, no, 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 no. The kingdom of God is about drawing many people in generously. And surprise, surprise, those of you who thought that you belonged here in the kingdom, you're going to find yourself on the outside. It is two very different things. And that's why I read this guy saying, ah, oh, blessed are those who eat at the kingdom of the feast, at the feast in the kingdom of God. Look at us. I mean, we've almost got the roll call right here. Here they are, me and my buddies. And we're blessed. We're going to be in the kingdom. And Jesus, well, let me, let me come at this again. Because I'm, I'm saying exactly the opposite of what you're saying. I'm saying that the kingdom of God is not about this tight group of Pharisees that is defining the kingdom of God around themselves. I'm saying that the kingdom of God is something much bigger than that. And it's drawing in people that you don't want to draw in, that you would never think of drawing in. There's a generous spirit here that you've not even considered. Now, where am I basing that on? I'd like to, to take you just on a quick survey of some of the things that have been said earlier about the kingdom of God. And in your harmonies, turn back to, say, page 18 at the very beginning. And many of these are going to come from the book of Luke. And while all the Gospels speak about the kingdom of God, <clears throat> let's try to focus on what Luke says, because he seems to be somewhat consistent in how he includes people. Some of you have already talked about those that were included right along. But look here, for example, on page 18 in Luke 1, the message of the angel to Mary. And here in verse 32, speaking of Jesus, the angel says, he will be great and we've called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Very beginning of the story of Jesus is talking about his kingdom never ending. But it would be easy to misunderstand that and say, oh, well, that is, of course, this kingdom that says, let's get rid of all these non-Jewish people. Let's get rid of these people that aren't like us. That is one way. And it's very possible that even Mary heard the angel's word somewhat that way. And as the story of Jesus unfolds, Jesus makes more and more clear what his kingdom is and is not. Turn forward just a little bit up to uh, page 46. Look at page 46. And when Jesus begins preaching here on page 46 in Luke 4, Luke 4, and there on the right-hand column, this is 
uh, verse 42, the people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Early on in his ministry, Jesus is making it really clear that he has to go everywhere. Even that is this generous spirit. No, I can't just stay here. I have to go and I have to preach the kingdom of God to them too. The kingdom of God was the message that Jesus was preaching. Well, what was he talking about? He was talking about, if you look earlier, look back a page earlier on page 44, in verse 33, also Luke 4, verse 33, in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by it. No, that's not where I want to be. Um, hmm. Well, it, it is it is not bad, but it's not exactly what I was looking for. But it's, it's Jesus healing and, and, and drawing people in and, and saying he wants them to come to the kingdom. Let me have you turn forward a, another another example here in uh, to page 50, uh, 57, 56, page 56 and 57. And in Luke 6, Luke 6, page 56. And Luke 6, verse 20, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. That was exactly the opposite of what most of them thought about the kingdom of God. Their thinking about the kingdom of God was it was for the rich, for the powerful, for those who could conquer others. And Jesus says, no, blessed are the poor. For theirs is the kingdom of God. He is constantly drawing people in that they either don't even think about or want to exclude. And if you turn the page to page 58, still in the Sermon on the Mount, Luke chapter 6 and verse 27. But I tell you, uh, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to them? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Jesus is expanding their idea of what it means to be a member of the kingdom. Being a member of the kingdom is getting beyond this idea that there are some people who don't deserve our love. Everyone deserves our love. Everyone should have a generous spirit from us if we are members of the kingdom. And then the passage that we referred to earlier, it isn't in Luke, it's across the page in Matthew. You see it there on page 58. And in the Matthew version, he says in verse 45, he says, God causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? God's generosity extends to people that we don't think deserve it. And God says, don't worry about it. My Love, my generosity, my goodness will possibly lead them to respond and also want to be a part of the kingdom. It's God's generosity that draws people into the kingdom. Just a couple of other passages, and I think I see a hand in the back. Let me just finish. Was there was that a hand in the back or just a okay? There is a hand. Let's go ahead and take that hand right now. Oh, I guess uh, while you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking. It starts out in chapter Luke 14, and it says, and it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And I was sitting here thinking, you know, he was generous and even eating with them, mm -hmm. putting himself in a setting because his agenda was so far, far reaching that he wanted the people that he's talking about may not even make it in to have an opportunity. Yes. And, and, and this comes back to the comment that John Cosgrove made a minute ago, that if we, if we have the intent of loving and drawing others in, 
It doesn't mean, okay, I just have to look at lame people, blind people, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus was generous toward the rich, powerful, famous, influential. His generosity extended to them. And like you said, by going to eat with them, he was showing a generous spirit to them. He wanted to draw them in. They thought that they were already in. They didn't know that they were on the outside. And Jesus generously wants to draw them in. Beautiful point. Thank you. Let's have you just look at a couple of other. Oh, please, John. Um, <clears throat> this is really complicated. Um, and it's not that easy. Words, words sound great. Um, but as soon as I start excluding, um, I am putting myself in the position of God. As soon as I start deciding, then I have decided I am God. And I think we have to think about that and be careful. The other thing is that, and we've talked about this before, there are people I don't like. They absolutely exist. And there's a couple of people out there that frankly, I think are evil. I, I believe that. And I don't like them. But I'm supposed to, but God loves everybody. And so am I. So how do I love when I don't like? How do I do it? It's not easy. These people I don't like, I'm not going to invite to my home because I'm concerned for the safety of my children and my wife, maybe. So how do I do this? Um, and upon reflection, I, I, I'm, certainly, I'm certainly not one to give the recipe for it, but a couple things. One is that I can pray for them. And by praying for them, I'm not saying I like them, but maybe I'm extending my love. And the second thing Ken brought up earlier is maybe just don't do harm. Talk bad about folks. Maybe just don't do harm. And maybe by not doing harm, maybe I can spin that into thinking maybe I, I do extend my love, even though I don't like it. It's, it's not easy. That's all. Anyway. Doug, you still there? Doug just concluded the class. <laughs> I'm here. I just concluded the class. Okay. Let's get myself plugged back in. My computer was dying. <laughs> Electricity. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, I needed to give it some electricity. I thought it was plugged in and it tells me it was dying. So I'm sorry. Okay, I'm back with you. John, I'm sorry that I missed the last part, but I think I caught the essence of what you were saying. And um, I had to quickly plug in my computer. Otherwise, it would have completely died. Sorry about that. Hey, let's, let's look at a couple of other passages in Luke. And then let's come back to our story and pull this together. I, I, I want us to see something about us becoming more generous people. And I'd like to make an assumption, but I may be wrong. And, and in, in this assumption, I hope we can come back to Gordon's comment and, and Keith's comment at the beginning. And that is that we really do want to become more generous people. And I hope that becoming a more generous person is not a painful thing. It's something that makes you say, oh, that means I'm going to have to give until it hurts. And, and so my my hope is that as a result of seeing this, you will admire God's generosity and want to become more like him in being a more generous person yourself. Gordon, I'm going to hold your hand for just a second, if I could. Hold that thought and, <laughs> and take a look at um, just a couple other passages in Luke here. Look on page 65. Page 65. Um, and the, um, oops, I did not mark this and I am, yeah, here it is on page 65, Luke 7 and verse 28. 
what Jesus says about John the Baptist. And again, we've studied this in the past, but the context is Jesus is affirming John the Baptist. In verse 28, he says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And again, that's a, a an interesting passage, but let me just play it out briefly. John is somebody who said about Jesus, Jesus needs to increase and I need to decrease. He had a generous spirit toward Jesus and toward others. And Jesus says, that is true greatness in the kingdom. That's the spirit of greatness in the kingdom. And yet there are people who are less prominent than John, and they can show that spirit too. And that is a spirit that the kingdom is all about. That's what the kingdom is like. Turn forward just a couple of other places in Luke. <clears throat> Look here in, on page 83. Luke 9, top of page 83. And this is Jesus sending the 12 out to preach. And he says, um, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God, and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no, no bread, no bag, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. Jesus is inviting them to go out and to give generously. In the account from Matthew across the page, in verse 8, he says, freely you have received, freely give. The freedom that they were to give to others was a reflection of what they had freely received from God. And that becomes, I think, the, the, the key idea of what they were to do when they were preaching the kingdom. The kingdom was about freely given, freely giving, because they had freely received. Now, let's come back to our story for today. If we see that the essence of the kingdom is freely giving, generously giving, because we have been so treated so generously by God. God has given to us so generously, so we want to give generously to others. Then what we find is that the people in the story who are making excuses for whatever reason, and we're not taking the time to unpack all of that, but for whatever reason, they cannot receive God's generosity. They're distracted. They've got other things that are more important to them. Perhaps they don't feel like they're worthy. Who knows what reason they're making excuses, but the re excuses they give appear to be distraction. And because they do not receive the generosity of God, God is the person making the, the feast in this case, they are unable to give generosity to others. It's only when we receive God's generosity that we can turn and give generosity to other people. And some of us may have a hard time accepting a gift. Have you ever had a hard time accepting a gift from somebody else? Have you ever had a hard time accepting God's gift to you? And that when he wants to be generous to you, you do not accept that gift. Jesus is talking about our ability or inability to accept God's generosity to us. And when we accept his generosity to us, we then can be generous to other people. And I believe that his punchline and what he refers to over and over again in this, in this day, yesterday's story or last week's story in this story, is he says, probably one of the best ways to cultivate that spirit of generosity is to be with people that you are least likely to be generous to. He describes them as the poor, the lame. We might describe them as the irritating, <laughs> the obnoxious. We might describe them in other ways, but Jesus says, when you are around those people, that aren't particularly pleasant to be around. And you can realize that their unpleasantness to you is a call for you to experience generosity to spirit. You're beginning to understand 
how God is generous toward you, because we're not always pleasant people to be around. God's generosity toward us is not because we are such lovable, cuddly, adorable people. God's generosity toward us is in spite of us, not because of us. And so when we hang out with people, when we put ourselves intentionally in the presence of people that we are less likely to be generous toward, to be gracious toward, we're beginning to understand how God relates to us because we're kind of like that ourselves to him. And it's, I think, this that is the biggest message of this, of this whole story where Jesus is saying, do you realize how generous God is with you? If you don't, one way to nudge you that direction is to be around people that's hard for you to be generous toward. And that begins to wake up your awareness of what it's like for God to love you. Because you're not always so easy to love yourself. And yet God loves you. And God treats you with such incredible generosity that it can stir up generosity in your heart toward others. And I'm going to take Gordon's hand, and then I think John's hand behind you, and then I want to briefly come back to our two comments, and, and then we need to wrap up. Please, Gordon, and then John. Never mind mine. <laughs> okay. Okay. John? Well, well, Gordon brought up a point earlier about the idea of does, does God's generosity run out? And I can we take from this story, though, know, perhaps that people who are not invited to the banquet or who do not end up at the banquet made their choice. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that God, I mean, God is ultimately the judge, but it's not that God is excluding them. Yes. Yes. It's that they made their choice. Yes. Thank you, John. I could not have said it better myself. And 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 the, the par this parable is very clear that it's not God saying you can't come. It's them saying, I don't want to come. Yeah. John? I remember God himself said, your house is left until you desolate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these people are saying no thanks to God. They have become so tight-spirited. You see that all of their comments, and we could have spent time on this, are really kind of silly. The man could have brought his wife. The guy could have checked out his oxen after the feast. The person who said, I haven't seen this piece of property that I bought yet. Really? You bought this sight unseen? <laughs> if that's the case, I've got a piece of property for you in Texas. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's some, some interesting comedy. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is their excuses were dumb excuses. These were non-excuses. They really just did not want to come, and they are excluding themselves. Okay, I'd like to come to Keith's comment and Gordon's comment. Oh, and Gordon has another comment. So, Gordon, let's take your comment, and then we need to wrap up with these last two comments here. I think this whole issue of how we deal with problem people is a very difficult one and one that ought to be studied. I mean, just look, you were talking about Luke where he said that people do not welcome you. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. up your feet and leave. Yeah. You know, well, what does that mean in terms of generosity? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gordon, you're, you're raising a good question. It's the end of class and we can't go there, but it's a good question. And it does say, okay, does generosity always mean doing just what a person thinks we're going to do? I would, I would put out there that even when they dusted the dust off their feet, that wasn't the end of the story for them. Even when Jesus walked away from some people, he sent others back to them later. So I think there's, I think there's, you're right. There's beautiful stuff to look at there. I want to come back to Keith's comment. And Keith, I wonder if you have any, any answer to your question yourself um, after our discussion today. And, and if you wanted to comment on the question you asked earlier. I'll leave it uh, open because the graciousness and the guilt are always a challenge, especially us as professors, we are asked to do more and more and more. Yes. Yeah. Help me figure that out. Yeah. Well, and, and let me just make this comment. I don't believe that generosity means 
that we become doormats and we say, do whatever you want to me, hit me again, punch me. I, I think that those are good questions. What does it mean to turn the other cheek? I mean, there's always things to continue to explore. What, what are we talking about here? Is it appropriate to say no? Jesus said no. Was that being ungenerous? So there's, there's many good things to, to explore. At the end of class here, let me see if I can have one simple point from the story that I would like us to focus on. And that is, God is incredible, incredibly generous to us. He gives us invitation after invitation and pours out more than we possibly ever could imagine, and certainly more than we deserve. And then he asks us, would you like to be like this? And he gives us the opportunity to become generous like he is. We become generous like he is by responding, not with an excuse, not with a shrug of our shoulders, but saying, oh, I want what you have for me. And then he says, if you need some nudging, if you need something to help you along this way, hang out with some people that are irritating to you, that you don't like. Hang out with some people that make it hard for you to be generous. And then you'll understand a little bit more of my generosity because that's that's how humanity is for me. I I love you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. And and that's a tough thing for us to get, but God is is nudging us to become generous like he is becoming generous. Ken, I'm going to end there and turn it back over to you. Uh, I want to leave you with one comment I was thinking about. I wrote a sermon a few years ago it's about different churches that are objective and what their I guess what their main goal was in life and it really boiled down to this not really what to say things did not work out through the years and decades like they did expect the Catholics would like to take God to Rome and lock him up and his generosity the Baptists would like to take him to their headquarters in Atlanta and lock him up and lock up his generosity and deal it out the way they like it sometimes. The Mormons would like to take him to Salt Lake City. The Adventists would like to take him to Washington, D.C. You can't do that. God's generosity is just too big to do that. And I think that's what Doug was trying to hammer home today and what the story was all about at the, at the banquet. The generosity cannot be stopped. When we do that, we run into trouble. We have to be very open with God's generosity. It's for everyone. Everyone. Next week, I'll be leading our discussion. Hope you'll be here. And if you would like to get on our email list, please let me know and we'll get you signed up today. Just come to see me. But thank you again, Doug. Just the best, as always. Amen. Father, thank you again for bringing us all together. Help us understand what it really means to be a generous people. That though we try, our generosity isn't close to what your generosity is to us. But through that, help us appreciate how important it is for us to reach out and truly be givers to others in such a way that help others, sometimes even at our own personal expense. Uh, thank you for all the blessings you've given us and your generosity in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.